Hey there, Slashaholics. Tonight's episode of Slash Tracks Action News is brought to you by Factor. With Factor, you get fresh, ready-made meals delivered to your doorstep when you sign up with Factor. Factor's chef-created meals are fresh, never frozen, and designed by dietitians to ensure every meal is packed with premium, science-backed nutritional quality. No meal prep, no dishes, no more unhealthy fast food. Factor offers the most convenient way to eat well while eating right. Fitness starts with food, and Factor makes it possible for you to achieve your daily goals through nutritious, purposeful eating. Factor helps you avoid fast food and ordering it. Factor meals arrive pre-prepared and ready to eat in two minutes or less, even faster than ordering in. Meal plans offer variety with the rotating weekly menu of 27 plus meal options and 33 plus add-ons like smoothies, desserts, and more. Factors No Hassle Prepared Foods make sure you always have something nutritious on hand when you don't have time to think about making lunch or dinner. Grab a prepared smoothie or keto shake for a quick snack or heat and eat a chef quality meal in just two minutes with no prep or cleanup necessary so you can stay focused on what you have to do. And if you use our special code on the screen right now, you can save 50% off your first order through Factor. Welcome to episode number 24 of Slash Tracks Action News. I'm Alex Vanover. And I'm Josh LaRue. Josh, it's good to be back in the studio after such a long podcast layoff. But before we get into the meat and potatoes of the show, before we get into the business email or any of uh, the greatest and latest headlines or horror or news or anything stories, we're going to get into today's sponsor, Josh. Do you want to tell us a little bit about that? Yeah, today this show is brought to you by Factor 75. You've already uh, heard the information at the beginning, and we'll be putting up the uh, code and stuff throughout the episode so you can uh, get some uh, great meals through Factor 75 delivered straight to your home. So check that out. Yeah, that's an exciting thing, Josh. Uh, people are so busy nowadays with, with work and just, I mean, trying to exercise, having kids, having family, commute back and forth to and from work uh to have a company actually go the extra mile to actually ship you healthy affordable uh meals that you're not gonna just be starving uh in between meals while you have them it's it's, that's a huge thing man uh this is a really really good thing yeah very convenient too just having it uh sent straight to you so that is you uh services before my wife and she was very happy so i'm gonna be trying them out too so. Yeah, that's exciting, man. Uh, and you know what? I, I'm going to go on record, man. You you could use a little bit more healthy living in your life. I think this is a gift from God that uh, Factor 75 decided to step in and maybe save the 80 slasher librarian by bringing these wonderful meals into his life. There we go. That That's that's what it's going to be that does it right yeah. there. It's yeah. going to be the Factor 75. <laughs> well, I don't want to – I don't want any – I don't want any facetiousness out of you, Josh. I want 100% commitment, all right? We're going to get you back on track. We're going to get you Mean Gene and Hulk Hogan workout style, the 80s workout videos. Do you, do you see those on YouTube that they've posted from the old Tuesday Night Titans? Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. Kind of like that uh, Hulk Hogan training video I had as a kid that had Mr. <laughs> Wonderful uh, yeah, they... the actual tape. Uh, Hogan couldn't, he was throwing it, he tagged in for Hogan on that workout program. Yeah, Hogan was too busy filming the A-team at the time. He couldn't be at the Titan Towers filming his own workout video. He had to have Mr. Wonderful step in. Uh, no, the workout videos with Mean Gene where he's 
he's uh, Hulkster shows up to Mean Gene's house at like five o'clock in the morning, and Mean Gene is smoking a cigar, drinking coffee, uh, and he's just about to ready to have bacon, oh, eggs, and pancakes. Uh, yeah. Yeah, Factor 75 is showing up in your life just like the Hulkster, and they're going to line you up. Line you out, buddy. Straighten you out, dude. So what you going to do? Yeah. <laughs> hey, Josh, what you going to do when nice comment, mean comment, nice comment, run wild on you? I'm going to be really happy, then I'm going to roll my eyes, I bet. What do we got? Yeah. All right, Josh, nice comment. First nice comment of the episode. You guys are seriously good at this. I have so much fun watching these. I don't understand how you don't have a million subscribers. And that's from Uhara Aglan Uni <laughs> underscore, underscore 1905. And that is regarding oh. Slash Tracks number 34, Hatchet. Well, thank you. I don't yeah. know why we don't have a million. Or I don't know why we don't have five million subscribers, honestly. Five million uh, subscribers? <laughs> <laughs> um, Hatchet. <laughs> Let's address the elephant in the room right now, Josh. Hatchet, um, I think, is one of our best riffs we've ever had. But for some reason, YouTube has suppressed it. Uh, Getting into the mean comment of the episode. This was exciting. And then you two started talking. And that's from (laughs) Geezer Geezer Fabizi, which is a great name, by the way. I'm not even going to make fun of it. Geezer Fabizi is a great name. Uh, and that's regarding Slash Tracks Reviews number one, Nightmare on Elm Street, 1984, the original classic. So he was stoked. The theme song, the content, the, the, the actual episode, the movie we were covering. Looking uh, at us. Yeah. He saw our faces and he wasn't, he wasn't mad until we started talking. So yeah. he liked looking at us. He liked what he saw on the left side and the right side. And then all of a sudden, boom, we opened our mouths. It was over for him. For old geezer Fabizi. <laughs> So he won't be coming back. So thanks for watching the show. Uh, we appreciate the interaction. And, uh, <laughs> you know, we'll try to change our voice, maybe be a different, completely different personality type for you, Geezer Fabizi. Yeah. Start it right now. Okay. Yeah. We're going to do it right now, dude. Okay, bye. Like, oh, my God. Today's episode is going to be so full. All right. Nice comment. Last uh, comment. Nice comment of the episode. So here we go. You two had me laughing so hard. This seems very unique and extremely funny. In the moment and not scripted at all. I don't usually comment, but I wanted you two to know. And that's from Eamon Soyguider. And that's regarding the last uh, Slash Tracks News episode. Slash Tracks News number 23. Oh, well, thank you, Sky. That's a great, you know what? That's a great, nice comment. That was a palate cleanser and a half, bud. Because (laughs) Geezer Fabizi kind of... You know, he had me question a lot of things about my life right there beforehand. <laughs> At least my voice, yeah. Yeah, my voice, the way I speak, uh, the inflection, the tone, everything, just off. But he wasn't very specific with how, yeah, we opened our mouth, but was it just everything or was it just one thing that old geezer didn't like? Right. <laughs> yeah. Well, oh, hey, you know what? Oh, go ahead, go ahead. Tonight, we're trying something new. We're going to try to watch our language a little bit, so... I'm going to get it all out real quick. So here it goes. Are you sure? Did you get all of it? (coughs) Are you sure? Okay. And Geezer Fabizi probably brought that on, uh, to be honest with you. The more I brought... I kind of wasn't upset with him, and then all of a sudden the more... You know, you kind of got into the cussing thing a little bit, and it kind of made me more mad thinking about Geezer. And, uh, yeah. You can get some out if you want to. No, I'm good. I'm going to be good this episode. I think I just broke the law. Yeah, you've been bad enough for both of us. Um, Josh, let's get into some fun facts. Let's do it. Hey, before we get into fun facts, (laughs) why don't you hit hit the Slashaholics with the Patreon? Yes, it's on the screen somewhere. Uh, Patreon.com forward slash 80 slasher librarian. And uh, you can email us where? At slash tracks2020 at gmail.com. And if you guys have any questions for us, if uh, you have any suggestions for future episodes, suggestions for future movies you'd like us to riff, uh, possibly review. Uh, if you have any uh, either or questions, would you rather, uh, kind of like the one we did uh, previous episode, would you rather 
spend the night at Camp Crystal Lake or 1428 Elm. We actually have a brand new one for this episode. Um, any like ask, you know, dear slashy questions. Uh, we have that brand new segment in this episode tonight, fresh as a fresh as a baby's bottom coming at you uh, tonight. So we got a lot of new stuff coming. But if you have any suggestions or any questions or if you want to sponsor the show, you want to get involved. Uh, and we also have on the Patreon, Josh, Josh announced it in the community on the Slash Tracks YouTube channel, Slash Tracks Network. Uh, we're going to have a thing on Patreon where we're actually going to have a wheel and it's like a wheel of topics and we're going to spin it. And we're going to interact with people uh, from the channel who are Patreon members that want to be involved with us and actually talk to us uh, live and in living color, Josh. It's going to be a lot of fun getting everybody yeah. over there. Oh, yeah. Mike Clark that is, is like, <laughs> dude, Mikey Clark is like ready to go for that, Josh. He's like, uh, he's committing to it. And I'm kind of into it because he said he's like, he's like decorating the room. He's like getting his, uh, his desk set up just so... Oh, oh. Yeah, it's going to be exciting. Uh, it's going to be nice to actually talk to some of the, the subscribers and some of the Slashaholics and, and to get some interaction and just kind of see who our, our friends are out there. I, I, I love to meet new people. It's going to be great. Yeah, you know, I think he's actually been in our Slash Track Studios green room for like a week and a half now, so we need to get that going. For <laughs> <laughs> Who's been feeding him if he's been waiting to be on the on the Patreon exclusive episodes. And what's he doing out there? Do you have the, you have the temp, the temp uh, out there working with him or what? Well, he's in there uh, hanging out with our past guests that we never let go home. You know, like Ryan, uh, Adam, uh, Marcus, uh, every, you know, everybody we've talked to. So Andre, far. everybody. <laughs> yeah. They're all, they're all just waiting out there in the green room, green room. They haven't been dismissed yet. Uh, first fun fact of the episode, Josh, are you familiar with the movie, the notebook? Uh, sort of. Yeah. Okay. It's a, <laughs> you're, you don't want to admit it. Um, the director of The Notebook wanted someone who wasn't conventionally handsome to play the male lead in the movie. So he decided to cast Ryan Gosling. <laughs> Instead of Steve Buscemi or something? <laughs> Imagine the movie with him, with Steve Buscemi in there instead of Ryan Gosling. <laughs> he... <laughs> I've just he wanted to cast somebody that wasn't conventionally handsome, so the first person he thought to cast was one of the most handsome men ever, Ryan Gosling. He's just got high standards, man. The creator. I'd like, that. yeah. What is the director look like? <laughs> How handsome is the director of The Rock? Uh, who is the director <laughs> of this film? Um, Josh, the Bermuda Triangle. So this is kind of like the Bermuda Triangle when Josh were '80s kids and '90s kids. So. Bermuda Triangle, uh, you know, so many movies and stories about ships getting lost at sea. There's a great DuckTales episode about the Bermuda Triangle. You stole uh, it from me. I was yeah. going to say the most important Bermuda yeah. Triangle documentary ever took place on DuckTales. Yeah, the DuckTales episode's great. Um, they're eating, like, seaweed uh, the entire episode. Um, the Bermuda Triangle has the same number of ship disappearances as any other part of the ocean. There's no difference. They have that the same. Sounds right. That sounds right. It's just a cool legend. Just a cool legend. It's kind of like quicksand. It's like you, as a little kid, you kind of think like, man, I'm, as an adult, I'm gonna have to avoid quicksand at all costs because every episode of whatever adventure show you watched as a kid had quicksand, and food fights. You remember food fights at schools? Oh uh, yeah, those that never happened. I never got into one food fight ever. I, in all fun facts of. For me, I started a crowd sing-along at a bar one night. It was karaoke night, and the microphone yeah. died. And we were sitting there, and the dude had to, like, go to his house to get the other one. So we're waiting 20 minutes. And we're, everybody's just sitting around bored and stuff. And I was like, I told my buddy, I was like, hey, I just want to see if this actually works in real life. And I started singing uh, Don't Stop Believing. And then somebody else started singing. Somebody else, really? And we were all, all singing it. And this stupid DJ is setting everything up, and we're like almost halfway through the song, like 20 people singing it in a bar, and he's all like, uh, uh, ladies and gentlemen, I'll uh, have the microphone working uh, in just a minute. Uh, it's charging up the, the thing on the second one here, and we can start back up. So he got one microphone working. He had brought another one and was set, getting it working, too, and uh, interrupted the sing-along, man. Finally had it happen. <laughs> DJs are supposed to facilitate the fun, not cock block the fun. Yeah. That was an amazing moment. That was on my bucket list. Start a, you know, random group of people singing a song. 
You know what was one of my, the cringiest moments of a sing-along randomly starting in any mo- any movie that I've seen? Uh, my Best Friend's Wedding? I, no, I've seen that movie like half half the movie, maybe once, like 20 years ago. Um, no, Scream 2, when Jerry, o- Jerry O'Connell starts singing to Nev Campbell in the cafeteria. Like the Top Gun thing or whatever? Yeah, it's, yeah kind of, but it's Jerry O'Connell can't sing. He's trying really hard. Um, it's awkward. It's cringy. Uh, I went to college. I don't remember, like, they made it almost look like a high school cafeteria situation. Like, people, they don't all have their classes uh, scheduled at the same time because they're adults. Um, There's no way they'd all be in there at the same time, first of all. And then number two, most of the people on campus, you don't know them. So they're not, they're they're just going to think you're an idiot if you start doing that. You're not the the most popular guy in college, you know what I mean? Yeah, and he's dancing around people's food, and it's like, dude, get the hell down! You know? Yeah, yeah, get, get down off the table. Don't keep getting down musically. Get down. Get, <laughs> he's getting down, baby. Woo! Um, hey, you did know. you know there, Josh? There's a thing called exploding head syndrome. It's a sleep disorder in which people hear loud noises or explosive crashing sounds in their heads uh, while transitioning in and out of deep sleep. So REM sleep, they'll hear crashes and explosions uh, when they're going in and out of deep sleep. What's your thoughts on exploding head syndrome, Josh? First, it makes me think of Boy Meets World when they get that R-rated tape of I Blow Up Your Head, part six or whatever. And uh, they keep watching it and then switching to an animal documentary when Mr. Feeney checks in because he's babysitting or whatever. Okay. Uh, <laughs> that's that's what my that, mind went to. That's like season one right sure. there. Yeah, yeah. Early, early Boy Meets World. No, uh, I actually have this thing when I'm falling into a deep sleep uh, where my bot, my whole body will jerk. And sometimes I get sleep paralysis, but I've never in my life heard explosions uh, going to bed. That, that would suck. That would really suck. <laughs> yeah, no, that's terrifying, man. Um, I've had I've had situations where, like, a, a loud sound will wake me up, like an actual loud sound that happened wakes me up and kind of scares me, or like, huh. Or I've had moments where I've actually talked in my sleep. Uh, my girlfriend Nicole said that I've uh, moved my legs, like I ran in my sleep. But I've never had exploding head syndrome, and here's to hoping you and I <laughs> never have exploding head syndrome, because it sounds terrible. Because, yes. Josh, once you get into your mid-30s, it's hard to go to sleep anyway. Uh like you have to get up to pee every two hours. Like, can you imagine if you had to go pee every two hours and you're having exploding head syndrome? That sounds like a <laughs> terrible time, pal. Um, in Iceland, Josh, if you don't know the address of where to mail a letter, uh, you can actually draw a map of the destination for postal workers and it can get to your destination. Wow. Yeah. So That's... you just draw a little map on the letter and um, sucks on both sides of the coin, Josh. Yeah, because you, you know, just imagine if somebody drew it really bad, and it's just like, like, three lines, like three lines, one going this way and connected that way, and like a circle with an X, and you're like, how the heck am I supposed to know where the hell I'm going? So. Yeah, no, like, um, what I was thinking is, there's no key, and there's no, like, um, what is it, what is it called on a map? We haven't even used a physical map in, like, 20 years, because it's on your phone. It's called MapQuest, but... Uh, <laughs> Like, distance, like, it'll say, this is a mile, or whatever, you know, an inch is a mile. Like, how would you even know? Is Iceland really, really, really small? I know it's small on the map, but is it that small that Uh, (laughs) they can find stuff because someone drew the destination on the letter? It's got to be bigger than, like, a big city, so, I mean, that... Sounds sounds horrible. Sounds horrible. it It sounds just... I would quit that day, probably. The person's like, well, I thought I mailed that letter. And it's like, well, I didn't have your address. Well, it's like I drew a map on it. (laughs) Post office in Iceland getting worse and worse. They can't even read my maps anymore. You didn't draw a stamp on there, so. Yeah, come on now. You didn't draw a stamp on there. (laughs) Um, There's no universally accepted definition, Josh, on how high a hill must be before it becomes a mountain. Okay. So, so like it's built like a little sand mountain. And people are turning mountains uh, out of mohills all the time. I guess that, and also, I guess our parents were right, Josh. They did have to walk up a mountain both ways to school. Mm-hmm. 
because uh, who's to say they're lying? Because there's no universally, uh, you know, accepted uh, uh, measurement for when a hill becomes a mountain. Yeah, they're I, not lying. I think our generation's version of we had to walk up a hill, you know, three miles both ways or whatever, is something like, oh, yeah, well, whenever we were kids, we had to leave the video game system on if we wanted to pick up you know, the save file later. <laughs> yeah, you and your save points. You and your freaking memory cards. I wish I had it that good. I had to risk burning down the house in order to beat Mario <laughs> Brothers 2. I tried to play... So, Nicole got me an NES for uh, Christmas. Like, an actual one from our childhood, which is awesome. Oh, that is cool. Yeah, I've been playing Mario Brothers 2. Uh, you get to, like, World 7, where you're playing Wart, because Wart is the boss, not Bowser. Bring they, they, they've never brought him back, which is really interesting. They should put him in Super Smash. But uh, what I was going to say is it's really difficult. You have to catch the fruit that's, like, exploding out of this little machine he's standing by. And you catch it, and you throw it at him, like, I think while he opens his mouth. So yeah. as a 39-year-old man, it's really hard. I was trying to beat Wart uh, with all these interconnected movements as, like, a 5-year-old. Uh, almost impossible. Uh, yeah. I don't think I ever beat it as a kid, to be honest with you. I think I got as far as the uh, third time you see the the multi the snake with the multiple heads or whatever. Yeah, all, yeah, yeah. All they do is all they do is spit fire. They don't spit the eggs out or whatever. So you have to use the little mushroom blocks to. Yeah, I think that's as far as I got as a kid. I tried so hard to beat that game. I think I finally did at like nine years old with a game genie, just so I could like. Because that last world, man, I think it's just six worlds. The last world, it's only three levels, but it's hard as heck. Mario um, Brothers 2 is... Yeah. Mario Brothers 2 is difficult. Uh, it's not Ninja Turtles difficult, but it is difficult. And I always had a really hard time with the first Mario Brothers because when you get to the last castle, it's a maze. And this is like pre-internet, so I, you'd, if you didn't remember, like, go over this tube and go under this whatever... Uh, you're just stuck, and you're going to run out of time. So as an, as an adult, yeah, as an adult, if you don't Google it or look it up on YouTube and you try to do it just by memory, good luck. Good luck. I, I did it this morning. I am not even – I was about to say I just played Mario Brothers 1 this morning, and uh, I messed up once. That I forgot was one step in the final castle. And guess what that step was, Alex? What? Right into the lava? I, I got no. I got all the way to where there's a hammer brother, and when you when you kill him and jump or jump uh, across the ledge after him, that's where yeah. Bowser's at. I went down a pipe right before him, thinking that was the last pipe I was supposed to go down, and it took me back to the beginning of the level. And uh, you but, blew it. But I beat it. I like levels like that, man. Like uh, when I do Mario Maker courses, sometimes I try to make them like that, like with the the maze and everything, like the original. Um, it, it was. I tell you what's more frustrating alex and i know we're kind of going down a rabbit hole and i'm sorry um <laughs> going down a pipe a mario pipe. yeah going down a pipe uh mario i almost said mario hole that would be bad um <laughs> Not so anyway, cola. <laughs> there's a uh little ledge eight one the first level of world eight where you have to jump on a little ledge like that big and a huge gap and then jump again immediately or you fall it took me like 20 tries today. I probably did that after like five as a kid, but uh, well, it, it's you, been a minute. <laughs> you can't back up and get your speed, so that makes it way harder. You have to like really play that weird, like, I'm going to get almost off the edge here and then go forward and jump kind of deal. There's not a lot of room. And, you know, they should bring Wart back because like everything in part two, I know it was from a different game, Doki Doki Panic, um, but everything else from the game has been used again. Uh, commonly in the Mario uh, games after that one, except for Wart. So that would be kind of cool to see a new Mario game where he's the villain again. Or a sequel, a, se a modern-day sequel to Mario Brothers 2. Make it happen, Nintendo. There, There's game developers, like independent game developers right now, that still uh, create and release, like, Nintendo games for the NES and for the SNES. And, like they're new, like they're brand new. They just use the technology that was used back in the eighties and nineties. It's really neat. Um, yeah, you can get cartridges from like eBay and stuff, right? Yeah, yeah. They, ha I mean, I haven't bought any personally, but I, I know people that have, and it's pretty intriguing actually. I think that's really interesting. Um, Josh, 
until 1913, children in the United States of America could legally be sent by mail. Oh, yeah. Well, well, no. We had a story on the show before where babies could be mailed. Or is that the same thing you're talking about? No, this is... Early 1900s or whatever? I don't remember talking about that on the show, but I'll tell you what. Until 1913, children could be sent by mail. Um... I think I've heard that, then. If we didn't talk about it, then I think I don't, I've heard that. <laughs> yeah, I don't think I've, I've done that one, but... Uh, Mikey, did we talk about it? You would know. You're like the, you're the dictionary. You're, you are the number one fan, so... Did, let us did know. they just poke holes in the boxes? Like you're sending, like, an animal or something? Like, have you know, you'll see those boxes on TV shows where they have holes in the side. Yeah. Is that what they did with children? I mean, how does that work? I assume, you know, put them in there, you know, with... Uh, a little bit of water, a little bit of food. And 1930. Cars weren't even, cars weren't even like a thing in 1913, were they? Like maybe the Model T. Like I think oh, that's yeah. pre. But like, if they wanted to go on a trip or something, I guess you just mail them, and uh, like you don't have enough room on the covered wagon or the horse or whatever, you just mail Timmy to North Dakota, I guess. I could have survived the Oregon Trail if I'd known that. So. Yeah, just skip over the dysentery completely. Yeah, just put yourself in a box. Yeah. <laughs> hey, that's um, on Switch now. A new version. That is. Oregon Trail? Oregon Trail, yeah. I prefer I the OG Oregon oh, Trail. Yeah. Thank I you want to play a DOS version for sure. Jane of the Jungle. Did you ever play that one back in the day? Prince of Persia? No. Uh, on the old computers? Yeah. No. Uh, I was a console guy forever. I, I wasn't didn't really play PC at all. Oh, I didn't know. I just played like at school, like computer lab, like like back when Oregon Trail. They'd let you get on a computer and play that. Uh, I saw a couple of their <laughs> old games back then. They were all pretty rough. Uh, you know what else is rough, Josh? Uh, what's coming up for Disney? And this is the last fun fact of the episode. Mickey Mouse is going to become part of public domain in 2024. Ooh, Mickey Mouse, the hunt for blood and honey. I was just going to, you just stole my material. Um, And you know what that means, Josh? What's that? They're going to make a horror movie with Mickey Mouse uh, because they've already done it with Winnie. And they have one in production that's already been made or is going to be made for The Grinch. Oh, Uh, yeah, so the mean one. Yeah, yeah. So Mickey Mouse, uh, just a matter of time before he's, Murdering people. <laughs> you see, I, I watched Winnie Pooh and uh, Winnie the Pooh and the Hunt for Blood and Honey, and uh, I got five minutes into it and walked away with that. Big old oh. white in my hair. It scared me so bad, man. Um, wow. Full on Nancy Thompson. I haven't watched it yet. Uh, I saw like the first two minutes, but it's definitely something that Slash Tracks is going to have to do because we've never done a current movie. I've heard you know, the re- I, I've read the reviews for Winnie the Pooh, Blood and Honey, and uh, the blood looks phony. Uh, the movie the was not big enough. <laughs> yeah, the honey doesn't look real. It looks like the honey from KFC and the little cheap packets. It doesn't look like actual honey. Um, no, I don't. I've I've heard the CGI and the effects are terrible. Dude, I watched the first four minutes of it, and I'm gonna go ahead and spoiler alert for any of you that have been like holding out to see this movie. Uh, it's about to go down. Uh, the movie, every creature from the Hundred Acre Wood that they use is like the bipedal ones. Uh, I guess they couldn't just couldn't figure out what they were going to do for Eeyore. Uh, so instead, the movie explains in the beginning with like really bad drawings <laughs> that Christopher Robin uh, met his wonderful pals Winnie the Pooh, Pig or Piglet, uh, Tigger, uh, Owl, Rabbit, and Eeyore, and he. For years, he would go out to the Hundred Acre Wood and bring him uh, picnics and honey and all that. And then he got too old and had to go to college. And he left them. And because of all the years that he took care of them, they forgot how to be animals. So they were starving to death. And they ate Eeyore. Like it shows his grave with his tail pinned to the cross on the grave. And uh, Christopher Robin comes back, people. This is big big stuff here. He comes back. takes his fiance to meet them. Piglet kills the fiance, like in the first four minutes, and then Piglet and Pooh drag Christopher Robin through the woods, and he's asking, why, Pooh, we're best friends, why? And they throw him next to Eeyore's corpse. So Eeyore is devoured by his friends, and Christopher Robin dies because 
they had to eat poor Eeyore. So all those times that Eeyore said, nobody cares about me. Mm -hmm. He was right. <laughs> he was he so was right. right. Yeah, I it just, wasn't just in Eeyore's head. Yeah, I just don't think they, they had a way to do Eeyore since he wasn't bipedal like all the other ones, bipedal. Um, so I think that's why they wrote it that way, dude. But it's just so depressing to see his little tail, like, in the wind right there on, like, a cross in the ground. <laughs> they could have they could have just put somebody in, like, an old-school horse suit. Like, you could have been the front legs, and I could have been the back legs. Um, all right, Josh. Slash tracks. If anybody wants us to ever consider that for an episode, I don't think Alex looks very excited about it, but I would love to make fun of it. Uh, let us know if that's something you'd like to see, and then we'll discuss it, maybe. I'm not hey. not it. <laughs> I'm not not excited about it. I would do it. I just I don't want to waste any money on that. Uh, like if we can somehow get our hands on it for free, then yeah. <laughs> oh, Batman! That's what I was going to tell you. Batman is going to be public domain in uh, 2035. So well, looking forward to that one too. Where uh, Batman's here probably everybody. Yeah. Batman. <laughs> looking to, looking forward to Batman just killing everybody for no reason at all. Batman the hunt for. The Bat Family, like he's just murdering the Bat Family or something. I don't, I don't even know what we've got. Batman versus the Bat Boy from National Enquirer. Oh no! Uh, lust for blood, Bat lust, Bat blood. <laughs> um. All right, so Josh, we're gonna get into the second. Would you rather of Slash Tracks news? You I ready? would rather just. Oh, that's not the Would You Rather. Okay, go ahead. This is a Would You Rather. Uh, so this is this is a new segment. So this is the second time we've done this segment. So would you rather? Ba -ba. All right. This is this now. This question was asked in the comments of Slash Tracks uh, podcast Action News number twenty three, and the YouTube's user's name was Aguzhan, and he asked us, "Would you prefer lifetime tickets to the modern WWE? So lifetime tickets means me and you could go to any show we want at any time, mm -hmm. or?" A one-time trip to the past to watch any past WWF pay-per-view front row and backstage passes to visit with the stars of that particular pay-per-view. Ooh, that's a good one. I would go with the second one. Me I would too. definitely love to go back in time mm -hmm. and see. Uh, I just don't know which show it would be. There's so many great ones that I wish I could have seen live. Um, probably Bret Hart. Uh, no. I'd probably do WrestleMania. Like, the kid in me would want to do, like, the night that Warrior and Hogan fought because it was Rest such a big deal. WrestleMania like, 6? Yeah, but the wrestling mark in me would like to see WrestleMania 1 just so I could see Roddy Piper and Hogan, you know, or WrestleMania 10 so I could see Sean and uh, Razor doing that badass ladder match, uh, which, yeah. was, uh, which was unheard of at the time. You know, it wasn't that uh, ladder matches weren't, you know, hundred a year back then so that was pretty pretty big deal i just watched wrestlemania 10 today by the way uh and i watched the ladder match uh this morning to be honest with you which is totally random that i did um the ending to that match uh in case you haven't remembered it or don't remember it Shawn michaels gets his foot caught in the ropes uh while razor's trying to climb the ladder and then he gets his foot out and razor's not to the top of the ladder yet and then sean gets his arm caught in the ropes out of nowhere, no one throws him into the ropes. He not, he did it literally just so Razor could have time to climb the ladder. Um, and that's a what a great match and what a terrible ending to the it's match. Like kind it of. was <laughs> it, he he should have just had his foot stuck in the Razor should have got up there a little quicker. I had um, heard that Macho Man Randy Savage was absolutely uh, livid at Sean and Razor because they went long. And there was a 10-man 10, 10 tag match that was supposed to happen after that, and they had to cut it. So 10 guys, like the Head Shrinkers, uh, Rick the Model Martel, Double J, all these guys got their match cut because Sean and Razor kind of went into business for themselves. Uh, so Macho was pissed off, and he let them have it backstage. But you know what? In hindsight, that match is a classic, uh, and it's probably good that it went uh, too long. But the ending was kind of hokey. Uh, the, him getting his arm caught uh, in the ropes directly after having his foot caught in the ropes was ridiculous. Bret Hart and Owen did. Was that the same show or was that the year before? Where no, Owen's, it's the same. Where Owen's coming out of the cage, gets his foot caught in the cage. No, that's Bret later Hart. on. The, okay. That that's, one, that, huh? that's SummerSlam. Okay, that that's, year. 
that was a good use of getting your foot caught in something. Like, you just climbed down right next to him when his leg was caught in there. Uh, but what would you do, man? Would it be uh, – which I, show would you want to go sit front row for? Well, I'm going WrestleMania 18 because I want to be in the front row where Hogan uh, and The Rock uh, wrestle each other. And that, that crowd in Toronto is – absurd it's like the greatest wrestlemania crowd or wrestling crowd i've ever heard or seen in my life um i get goosebumps watching it back to this day uh oh, yeah. and i'd love to be able to go backstage and talk to hulk after the match get his thoughts on what he was thinking the philosophy of the match i'd like to talk to the rock and how ask him how he handled because they basically did a double switch in the ring yeah rock they, was they... the baby face hogan was the heel they let the crowd dictate and yeah they went with Four minutes into the match, all of a sudden Hogan's posing and doing all of his babyface stuff, and the crowd just loved it, um, including me. Oh, I don't, yeah. yeah, I don't see how I don't go back to WrestleMania 18. The honorable mention would probably be um, Royal Rumble 92. It's like the greatest Royal Rumble ever. Ric Flair went, oh, came in at number two, work. and yeah, Flair came in at two and won it uh, to win the the WWF World Championship at the time. Uh, everybody was in that match except for Warrior uh, because he was on the outs with WWF at the time. Like but, the t- time. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> that point. Uh, Roddy Roddy Piper had won the IC belt earlier in the show from the Mountie, and then Piper had his whole storyline was Piper had never won any gold in the WWF, so the like he wins IC, and then he's like, "I'm going for two. and then he goes into the Rumble. So you got that storyline, which was great. Uh, and then you've got, I mean, it's just, it's a great pay-per-view. They had a really great opening match. I think it was the Hart Foundation versus, um, it was either the Hart Foundation or the Rockers versus the Orient Express, but it was just, a, I mean, those tag team matches at those pay-per-views, those Royal Rumbles were just amazing. Uh, I miss the tag team division, man. Yeah, so much. yeah it, it's sorely lacking today. I'll tell you what Hogan would tell you backstage before the next uh, next thing. If you went and talked to him, I'd tell you well, what he'd tell you that night. Brother, out of my way. I broke my ribs. Seriously. Get out of here. <laughs> yeah, he's <laughs> selling it. <laughs> Listen, dude, and I also, my back, I still have my back torn apart from body slamming Andre at WrestleMania 3. <laughs> and my head still hurts from Undertaker uh, giving me the tombstone on the chair that never touched the chair. But Yeah, even though his head was that <laughs> far from the ground. Um, and Undertaker, I heard an interview later on where the Undertaker's like, yeah, uh, he sold that like I actually hurt him for forever. And then I went back and was rewatching the match and his head is like two feet from the ground. And that's where the distrust, distrust and the kind of I don't like Hulk Hogan because Undertaker's not really a big Hulk Hogan fan. And it all stems back to that. Because Hogan well, was working got, him. Hogan got him the job in WWF. That's the crazy part. Like, uh, they, they worked together on... Uh, uh, Suburban, Suburban Commando? Commando. Yeah, and he, had already, he already knew that Mark was wrestling, you know, down in Georgia and everything. And, uh, yeah, he, he's the one that, like, turned Vince McMahon on to him to get him there. Undertaker was afraid he was going to be the uh, Eggman. Uh, when he showed up because of that giant egg with the godly gooper or whatever gooper. Uh, but, man, uh, Hogan... Hmm. Ult- Ultimate Warrior and Hogan was a good, like, battle, but, like, Undertaker... Undertaker's the only guy, I think, that's beaten Hogan in his heyday and in his, like, uh, when he came back in, like, the early 2000s. Like, he beat him for the belt both in both generations. That's yeah. not something a lot of people can say. Uh, Taker, two of Taker's reigns as champion, even though one of them was like only a week long or whatever, came from defeating Hulk Hogan uh, for the belt. Uh, 2002 or 2003 and uh, 1990. 91? 91 and 2002. And 2002 was actually a wrestling fact that I cut from this episode for time. And since you brought it up, I'm going to talk, say it right now. We're not even in wrestling. Uh, 2002 holds the record for most uh, world heavyweight uh, title changes with eight in that year. So the year Hogan got the huge crowd reaction for that WrestleMania 18, Vince decided to call an audible, and all of a sudden Hogan was beating Triple H for the belt after Triple H beat Jericho. Then Undertaker uh, beat Hogan like very shortly after that. 
Yeah. Uh, it was Rolling Taker. It was the rolling, 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 yeah. rolling. Yeah. The biker Taker. When Hogan's bike wouldn't start during their feed. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> then Taker lost to The Rock. Brock lost to Brock Lesnar. Brock Lesnar lost to The Big Show. And then The Big Show lost to Kurt Angle. So there's eight title changes in the That's... same year. What about the night they did the uh, champion burnout or whatever it was called, where like every time somebody pinned somebody in the match, it was like eight of them or whatever, six of them, uh, they became the champion. And so whoever was the winner, whoever got the last pinfall or submission by the last bell was the winner, the current champion. I remember. So, yeah. <laughs> I remember that premise, and I remember that happening, but I don't remember who was in it, and I don't remember what belt it was for. It was for the world. It was for the main belt. Okay. I just, uh, yeah, it, it was weird. Jeff Hardy was the champion, uh, and the bell was about to ring. Triple H pinned somebody, and Jeff Hardy got up too soon. And instead of breaking up the pin, he pins he goes to pin someone else. But it didn't make any sense because he was already the champion at that point. It got to all look it up, people. It's really cool. It, it's real. It's it's bad, but it shows you that not all of their ideas are good for gimmick matches. It was it was a mess. Okay. I want to. So we're not in wrestling yet. We're actually going to get into sports. But I have two things I want to say about that. Okay. They're, they do have bad ideas for gimmick matches. Um, <laughs> historically, steel cage matches uh, back in the South, uh, NWA, WCW, AWA in Minnesota, a steel cage match. The reason they had brought a steel cage in was to keep the two people inside the cage. Okay. When the WWF and WWE now, they took the steel cage, the big blue cage, and the, uh, the objective wasn't to stay in the cage and to destroy your opponent. It was to escape the cage. That's a weird uh, spin on it that I, I, it's bizarre. I don't really understand that. I mean, it's kind of cool, I guess, but it's weird. Um, and then the other thing they do, sometimes they'll have matches where it's like, okay, we got a fatal four-way or a three-way and say Josh is the world champion. Um, in a, in these title matches, sometimes Josh is the champion. But if I pin one of the other guys in the match that's not the champion, I still win the belt. I hate that. I think the champion should have to be the one that's pinned or defeated. I, yeah, I don't like it when they do that. Because it's like just a handicap match if you look at it that way. Yeah, why would the champion ever agree to being in – a match like that why yeah. would you ever agree to that you would never agree to that you'd be like okay yeah if alex gets pinned all of a sudden i lost my world heavyweight championship you would never agree to that what about when macho man uh won the belt and then hogan the next night came out on uh, yeah WCW? He won it was a tag match man it was a tag match for the world title in WCW. Yeah, I, I remember that kevin nash and sid versus macho and or macho and sid versus kevin nash somebody and it's like whoever win pins get, so whoever's tagged with the champion doesn't have a chance to win the belt yeah so what it, why do they even want to be in the match yeah wcw uh, yeah okay um Okay, before we get into Slash Track Sports, I want I have one more thing to say about Macho Man. Okay. Uh, okay, WrestleMania, or excuse me, Royal Rumble 93, the last two competitors in the ring were Yokozuna and Macho Man. So those are the last two guys in the ring. Whoever <laughs> wins faces Bret Hart for the belt at WrestleMania 9. Macho Man has Yoko on the ground and hits him with the flying elbow drop Tries to pin him in a Royal Rumble, okay? That's not how Royal Rumbles work. A Macho Man's been in multiple before this. Yeah. Uh, but this is the same Macho Man that when Jake the Snake Roberts came out, uh, after Jake was eliminated, Macho jumped the top rope to chase Jake down, so he yeah. eliminated himself. Um, Macho lands the flying elbow drop, tries to pin Yoko. Yoko kicks out, and Macho flies off after the kick out and is eliminated. Okay, I need Alex's voice for this, but I kind of picture in the back, like, Randy talking to Yoko, you know, being like, thinking, 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 it would look pretty cool if you threw, you know, so how, how would he how would he sell it? You know, not even thinking about the pinfall thing. All right, so Yoko, here's the deal here. Uh, what I'm, I'm thinking here, uh, and a uh, big lights, camera, action, coffee, cup of coffee in the big time with Yoko, yeah. <laughs> I'm going to hit you with the elbow drop, dig it? And then 
you're Yoko, you're so powerful. For some reason, I don't know why, I'm in the danger zone, yeah. I'm going to try to pin you in the rumble, yeah. <laughs> you kick out because you're so powerful, yeah. Wouldn't that make you look... Uh, uh, wouldn't that make you look dumb, Randy? Or I'm in the danger zone. I'm in okay. the combat zone, dude. Okay. okay, okay, okay. Yeah, and and he kicks out, and then I fly yeah. over the top rope, and Yoko is the new number one contender. Yeah. <laughs> they had nobody to vet that finish with. Where the yeah. hell is? Where's Pat <laughs> Patterson yeah. and Gerald Briscoe? Maybe and, Pat was like, you know what? Like he argued with Randy for like ten minutes about it. He's like, but there's no pinfall. Randy's like. Yeah, but he can throw me out. You know, <laughs> yeah, we're, and Pat's like, you know what? Whatever. Where's Bruce? Where's all these guys in the back trying to? Um, it makes no sense. But we'll talk about some more wrestling when we get to wrestling. Let's get into Slash Track Sports, Josh. Oh boy, let's do it. Uh, okay, here we go. Um, Ken Griffey Jr. Uh, do you do you recognize that name? I do know that name. I've heard okay. it. <laughs> Ken Griffey Jr. Uh, hit over 600 home runs in his uh, Major League Baseball career. Legendary outfielder. One of the all-time greats. Ken Griffey Jr. <laughs> last played for the Cincinnati Reds in 2008. Okay? Ken Griffey Jr. this season will be the fourth highest paid player for the Cincinnati Reds this season. So he's, he hasn't played for them in over 15 years, but he's going to be the fourth highest paid player because he agreed to the Bobby Bonilla deferred payment agreement uh, when he signed his contract extension in 2000. So Ken Griffey Jr. slash Track Sports salutes you. Yes, Ken Griffey Jr., uh, Bonilla, uh, Jack Nicholson, Marlon Wayans, uh, Billy D. Williams, everybody that got paid for something you didn't even do. <laughs> yeah, wow, uh, they, man. All the ones that actors I named off are people from Batman movies that didn't end up doing what they were contracted to do they end up changing it and stuff and they i think jack nicholson still gets paid for every batman movie to this day what for did he sign up for sequels or something and they just never made them with him or something he whenever he agreed to be the joker uh that was in he made it in his contract he gets a take of any batman movie after that and he gets killed uh like he 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 was smart with that he he knew there was money uh coming with that franchise uh marlon wayans was supposed to be robin uh, he was hired for Batman Forever, and they fired him and got Chris O'Donnell, but they still had to pay Marlon from because of their agreement. Uh, Billy D. Williams, he was supposed to be Two-Face. He got paid for Batman Forever. So, like, two or three people got paid for Batman Forever that weren't even in the movie. I was just making a comparison to the sports thing. They've been all. doing stupid stuff with the Batman franchise for years now. Uh, we've talked about Batgirl. They made the entire Batgirl movie made the whole thing, edited it, scored it, paid the actors, paid the cinematographers, paid the producer, director, and then they just shelved the movie. They just locked it in the Warner Brothers studio. The what? only people the only people that got to see the movie were the people who were in the movie. And yeah. then they and then they locked it up in the vault. One day it'll come out, I think just because of Michael Keaton, I really do. But um, probably not till after he's gone. Um, I think if they put the movie out, Alex, that Brendan Fraser uh, would have got two Oscars, you know, one for best movie, Batgirl, <laughs> yeah, and best actor for The Well. I mean, look, they, they took away one of, in all seriousness, it was awesome to see Brendan Fraser. Uh, I found that he got an Oscar for that, for The Well. Yeah. Uh, it's great to see him back. He had some real bad depression problems and stuff. I'm glad he got past that. He brought it on himself by accepting the role, the role in Looney Tunes back in action. Uh, he did that to George himself. <laughs> George of the Jungle, man. Well, didn't McDonald's have a tie-in with George of the Jungle? Wasn't there, like... They, I'm almost positive that oh, yeah. it, there was yeah. a McDonald's Happy Meal for George of the Jungle. Um, I The Looney Tunes back in action was the one that was most egregious to me because it was just... It was a couple years after Space Jam, uh, maybe a couple years too late. Uh, it was just a bad movie. It, it, it reminded me of Rat Race. Uh, it, or Snow Dogs, or Sled Dogs, or whatever, that Cuba Gooding Jr. movie. Yeah. Like, do you remember in the 90s when they just started taking, like, A-list actors who were, like, seriously great actors and started putting them in schlock like that? Yep, that, that's... That was weird time. <laughs> yeah, it was a weird time. Um, here's the second Slash Track sports story of the night. 
Um, NCAA March Madness isn't just for men. It's also for women, Josh. So the big tournament for college, college basketball teams. Um, something happened that's never happened. Iowa's Caitlin Clark. So this is a female player. She had the first ever 40-point triple-double uh, in men's or women's NCAA tournament history. So she, dude, she had 41 points, 12 assists, and 10 rebounds. Never been done before or since. So Iowa's Caitlin Clark, huge stat line, and I just think she deserves some props from Slash Drags. I don't know what a triple double is, but it sounds impressive to double. It'd be a sixer. There you go. Uh, tri- triple double is if you get 10 or more uh, in one category three times. Okay. So okay. sometimes basketball players are really good at scoring, so they'll get a bunch of points, but they won't get rebounds. Okay. And then sometimes they're really good at rebounds, but they're not good at assists, yeah. like passing. She did it. She did it all. And not only did she do it all, she did it like no one else has ever done it before in uh, March Madness history. So, yeah, that's big time. Uh, I, this isn't even a story that we have written down. I just want to mention it real quick. Okay. The, Sac- the Sacramento Kings, the N- NBA basketball team, the Sacramento Kings, just uh, qualified for the NBA playoffs. Uh, and this is news because they hadn't been in the playoffs since 2006. So they broke the longest playoff drought in American sports, uh, currently in American sports. So they, it, it had been since 2006, so over 17 years. So I just want to say congratulations to the Sacramento Kings. That's a really big deal. They're really exciting to watch, Josh. They have this thing at their basketball arena. It's called Lighting the Beam. So mm-hmm. at their stadium, Arco Arena in Sacramento, they have like a like a big beam. It's almost like the bat sig- symbol. So whenever they win, their colors are purple. They'll light a huge purple beam in the middle of the stadium up into the sky that That's people cool. and fans can see from miles around. So they call it light the beam. That's cool. Yeah, it's really neat. It's really uh, interesting. It's really like, uh, I don't know. It's getting people that aren't even into basketball into it because it's just so interesting. It's really neat. That. I've always wanted to see, uh, like, in person, not on a video, like what you're talking about with the big beam, like a bat symbol-looking thing up in the sky. I've never seen that in person, you know, like a big spotlight. Yeah, uh, like actually see it at night. Yeah, yeah, that'd be cool. If you had a bat symbol, say say you were a superhero, Josh, what would your symbol look like? If I was a superhero? Like, uh, what would your symbol look like for you, Josh LaRue? That's a really good question. I wish I had time to think on that one. Um, I don't know. I guess like a, a microphone? <laughs> no, it would be a, be a can of crystal clear Pepsi with a big oh. mop of hair around the side. There we go. And maybe a microphone in front of the can of crystal Pepsi. Ecto cooler. Yeah, you look up in the sky. It's like there's the ecto cooler and the crystal clear Pepsi with the luxurious locks. Josh is nearby. We need him. The people, the Slashaholics need Josh. I was lighting the damn beam for you when you were sick, but you just never <laughs> showed up. I was at uh, the bottom of the stairs of the building, just like, oh, there's no way I'm going up there. Yeah, you're like, I need a break. Uh, all right, last sports story of the episode. Former Broncos and Ravens defensive end Derek Wolf said in 2013, he actually bruised his spinal cord. And he said, I was paralyzed for three hours, and then he played two weeks later. Couldn't walk. He's paralyzed. He has a bruised spinal cord, and he ended up playing two weeks later. Wow. What's your thoughts on that? Uh, It sounds like it was dangerous. Um, But, yeah, that's that's impressive. That's an impressive feat. I (laughs) – Well, I – you know what's funny is, like, I don't even look at it as impressive. I look at it as scary. Uh I know I always talk about sports players like it's like, well, you're getting paid millions of dollars. You should play. And a lot of players take days off when they probably shouldn't. That's a situation, Josh, when you definitely should probably take some time off. Yeah. Um, The pressure to play in the NFL is, I think, greater than in most like baseball or basketball. Um, Load management is more accepted in those sports. And the NFL is really barbaric. It's like you got to get out there. There's only 16 games, 17 games. That's before the playoffs. There's big money on the line. Um, I can't imagine having that much pressure on me. No. Um, I literally couldn't feel my legs for like a second or two whenever I had that wrestling match injury that's on the channel. Uh, 
Mm -hmm. Nobody's ever seen that. You want to see my back pretty much get broken. It's on the channel for you to watch. Um, no, and after that, I wrestled, like, maybe one match a year for, like, the next two years. But I can't imagine going back to full-time after that because it was, it was, it's a wake-up call, too, and scary. Um, you remember you're mortal, and you can be hurt, and you can bleed. And uh, when you can't feel something like that, that's freaky. So I guess it's just part of the part of the system, you know, to make the money. He's just got to get back out there and do it. That's his job. Mm -hmm. so. And some he was probably afraid somebody else was going to take his job if he didn't get out there fast enough. Um, I never hurt my back in a big wrestling match or a football game, but I hurt my back one time. I run every day, basically. And I <laughs> here's a little known fact. Uh, if I see bottles or cans, I'll pick them up and I recycle them. Well, I found there was a huge bag of cans on one of my runs. I'm like three and a half miles from my house. Somebody had put in a, put a huge bag of recycled cans like by a light pole. And I ran by it. I'm like, I'm picking these up and I'm running these home. So I ran. I got another three and a half miles home after I picked the bag up. I get three miles into it. I'm literally half a mile from making it home. And my back completely went out. Oh, um, shit. Yeah, and all that, Josh, for seven dollars in recyclables. <laughs> <laughs> I was so I wasn't pay, I wasn't playing for a million dollars. I wasn't playing in an NFL game. I wasn't in a big money wrestling match. I was literally trying to run four miles with a bag of bottles. And when I counted it, it was seven dollars. My back went out, Josh. <laughs> like somebody hit a button on me. I bent over. And I had to like pull myself up, like like knees to, to hips, and straighten myself out, um, all for a bag of cans. So I, now it's hilarious, but when it happened, that was really scary. I only made thirteen dollars more than that when I hurt mine. So oh you know, yeah, you're I got paid like twenty dollars. Yeah, so <laughs> for a main event match, huh? That wasn't main event. I was just helping out rookies. Uh, it was all rookies in this company, and I was friends with the owner. I'd wrestled with him for a couple years at that point all over the place, and he called in favors from, like, me and a few other people to come wrestle with his trainees. And, yeah. Uh, yeah, 20 bucks, and it cost me, like, 30 in gas for the round trip, and I hurt my back, so. <laughs> that sounds yeah. about, like, how much we make for Slash Tracks News. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. 30 make 20. Yeah. Hey, Josh, let's get into the next segment. Let's get into Slash Tracks Wrestling. Let's do it. Kind of already been there, but we can do it again. <laughs> We're going right. Hey, we got to. You got to come back with me, Josh. All right. Back where? Back to the future. All right, Josh. Slash tracks wrestling. Let's do it. All right, Josh. As you know, and the Slashaholics probably know, WrestleMania 39 uh, is going to happen this weekend. It's a two-night extravaganza. So <laughs> down three nights uh, from last year. Down four nights from the COVID year. So instead of a typical seven day extravaganza WrestleMania, just kidding. It's, it's two nights. It's been two nights for a while. Yeah. Um, Josh and I think it's ridiculous. Um, it's, you know, what we should have done, Alex is during yeah. the COVID thing, whenever they had the Thunderdome, mm -hmm. we should have bought tickets so we could be on camera and just promote the hell out of the channel. We should have hey, that is a great idea, but 2020 <laughs> was kind of like when the channel for me and you started yeah, in, yeah. in earnest. So, um, Still would have been fun to be on there. <laughs> oh, it would have been awesome. I mean, we we really. Do you remember when someone uh, they put Chris Benoit on one of the screens on the Thunderdome? Yes. Yeah, yes. and it, Chris Benoit, Chris Benoit's face showed up on a WWE program. I cannot believe that they got away with that. There was a naked woman uh, on one of them, like, and there was a dude that uh, was like in his boxers or something, like overweight, sitting in a chair. Uh, I think there was one, somebody holding up a ransom note. Uh, people had fun with it. That's, um, they were doing that at baseball stadiums, too. Like, you could get a, a full-on cardboard cutout of yourself <laughs> and put it at the stadiums, like, in the seats and stuff. It was kind of cool. Um, but WrestleMania 39 is going to happen this weekend, uh, Saturday and Sunday, uh, in Los Angeles at SoFi Stadium. And two of the two of the matches that caught my eye, you know, Cody Rhodes versus Roman Reigns for the Universal Championship. So uh, I really want Cody Rhodes to come away with the belt, uh, not only because I want Roman Reigns' reign to be over because it's been forever, but I also want Cody Rhodes to win because I want him to bring back the wing, winged eagle title that he's been kind of uh, saying he wants to bring back. 
And uh, it's kind of inevitable at this point, I think, because uh, rumors have been swirling around that Roman Reigns is going to take a really long break after WrestleMania. So how is he going to take a long break if he's not going to drop the belt? Uh, Brock Lesnar's done it. <laughs> Goldberg. Oh, done it. you know what? <laughs> You're actually right, dude. Like they had matches and pay-per-views without the champion. Yeah. That's that. If you're the champ, listen. That's the point. <laughs> I'm old school. If you're the champion, and you decide to accept that role, you need yeah. to show up to the pay-per-views into the shows and defend your title. Exactly. That's did ridiculous. You ever, did you ever do e-feds back in the day? No. Oh man, you time machine. Uh, that was so much fun. But it, it's my point is about pay-per-views. Uh, and E-Feds back on, like, they still do them now. I don't know how they do them forums, maybe, but it was AOL back in the day. You had chat rooms and stuff. Yeah. And sometimes they'd have, like, an Angel Fire website. I had one of those. Uh, and you pick a character that's a real one or certain places you had to make up your own. You get booked in matches. And the way that you win a match is by doing better typed-up promos, like role-playing. Uh, so you top up a promo before the Monday night show. And then once a month, there'd be a pay-per-view. And the people that won the most matches uh, with the best promo type-ups or whatever would get the championship match. I mean, that's what pay-per-views, and that would come full circle. Like, that, mm-hmm. that's, that's what you go to the pay-per-view for. That's when <clears throat> the main title, the secondary title, the third title, the tag title, the women's title, all that. That's when all that's supposed to come to a head. But that's like Monday Night Raw and SmackDown every week pretty much nowadays. Like, they... They're throwing the baby out with the bathwater? Is that the right thing? I well, guess. I agree with you 100% because when when Josh and I were kids, you would never even see a star wrestle a star. Thank you. Until a pay-per-view. I mean, Josh, let's say Josh is the champion. Or Josh is just a really over star for the WCW or the AWA or the WWF. Josh is like Josh is going to be wrestling like the milkman, like Bill Bryant or like Steve Johnson. Like he's not wrestling. Like Josh isn't going to be wrestling another star mm-hmm. until there's a feud and they're going to blow it off at a pay per view. Um, uh, yeah. M- Monday Night Raw and uh, Monday Nitro, uh, they had to have content every week to get ratings, so they started throwing their stars at each other uh, in matches every week, and it basically ruined. Uh, the way wrestling ran their business. Yeah, it changed it completely. Uh, Bischoff is the thing for that because Vince held on to the jobber thing a little bit longer after <clears throat> Bischoff started up Monday Nitro. Uh, but I just wanted to make a little small amendment to what you said there and say I would more likely be the local indie wrestler that gets to go on Raw and get his ass beat by, uh, you know, a star. A the guy to my kid. Star. You're like, hey, I broke. <laughs> Broke my back wrestling Dynamite Kid because he was too stiff with me. <laughs> well, that that's what that's how they usually did it back then. Is uh, I know they did the New York Manhattan Center like every Monday Night Raw, but also whenever they would travel and stuff, they would yeah. use local. They would use local indie wrestlers, pay them like two hundred bucks, and they'd get to wrestle on the show. You know, and they uh, if you a couple times like Jim Powers was like one that almost won a match one time, and I was like, whoa, is this the, the unknown guy never wins. And Jim Powers was like one of the jobbers for the stars Yeah, on Raw. And he, he, he actually got some offense. But usually if you saw a jobber doing offense, Alex, they were doing that. They were going into business for themselves and whatever star they were wrestling would probably get stiff with them right afterwards if you pay attention. Because uh, some of them did. They tried to get some licks in. And uh, you do that against like Scott Steiner, Rick Steiner, or somebody like that, you yeah. your neck broke. Do you remember, well, of course you remember this, everybody remembers this, but when we were kids, and it was one of the first Monday Night Raws, is when Razor Ramon wrestled, uh, it, he wasn't even the one, two, three kid yet. He was he was the kid, and then he became the lightning kid, and then he became the one, two, three kid when he pinned Razor Ramon. In a uh, six position. <laughs> yeah, and he wasn't, he was. He, he wasn't even, uh, he was a nobody, but it, they set him up as a jobber. He was probably signed as a talent, and they made him look like he was a jobber, and then Scott put him over, and it made him a star. Uh, that was a big that, deal. Well, it didn't help while he pinned Razor. He had Razor's legs pulled up, and he was, like, shaking his head <laughs> with the count, <laughs> and he's like... <laughs> yeah, it was like when Ultimate Warrior and Hogan were doing the Mercy at WrestleMania six, and, like... 
I think it was Warrior who was like lower. Yeah. And it looked like he was yeah. doing something oh, to exactly. Hulkster. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Um, the second match uh, that caught my attention at WrestleMania 39 this weekend is uh, John Cena is coming back to wrestle Austin Theory uh, yeah. for the U.S. title. And Cena's, you know, here's another match, though, and it's interesting. Uh, Cena's an all-time legend. Austin Theory was Vince McMahon's, like, pet project until Vince had to take a step back and was removed from his position because of the scandals and stuff. But um, it's an interesting match. I think that they're probably going to use John Cena to get Austin Theory over. Uh, and I just don't see how, because John Cena is not going to wrestle full time, so I don't see how Theory doesn't win this match. Yeah, they're not going to put. Yeah, you're right. They're not going to put the U.S. title on John Cena when he's going to go immediately film another movie or another commercial. That dude is yeah. in like every YouTube ad right now. It's like, dude, I know you like money. We all like money, but <laughs> Come on, it's too dude. much. It's you're, becoming you're, rock level. Yeah, well, he's like the Nicolas Cage of commercials on YouTube now. You know, like, Nicolas Cage is, like, in every Redbox movie. Yeah. Oh, yeah. John Cena's in every commercial. <laughs> Rent, Rent.com or whatever. Uh, Did you know uh, that you can build your Redbox. credit with yeah. Rent.com uh, by renting? Um, I was going to say, uh, you, you brought up Nicolas Cage. This is totally off topic, but uh, Renfield is coming out, and it's uh, Nicolas Cage is playing Dracula, and basically, it's coming to the theater. It actually looks semi-decent he's Nicolas Cage <laughs> yeah he's gonna be good um he hasn't really been in like a big time movie in a long time so it'll be interesting to see Nicolas Cage back in theaters uh and it'll be interesting to see him in this really oddball kind of like out of it just I don't even know how to describe it it looks like a role perfectly made for Nicolas Cage <laughs> he's gonna he play Dracula yeah he's... looks kind of kooky kind of quirky uh Renfield is his like slave and he's trying to get away from Dracula. It's almost like a breakup movie, but he can't get away from Dracula. It's going to be good, I think. <laughs> I, I think it'll be worth it just to see him in that role. Um, yeah. Maybe maybe this will lead to The Rock Part 2 and uh, Con Air Part 2. We'll see. Yeah, or National Treasure 9 or something. Uh, Those are fun. Gone yeah. in 60 Seconds. It will, won't be a, uh, a, a movie about them you know, stealing cars. It'll be about how fast his career disappeared after he made some... <laughs> Terrible film choices. Gone in 60 Seconds 2, the, the life story of Nicolas Cage and his bad <laughs> financial and uh, business choices. Um, real quick about WrestleMania this weekend. Uh, I was talking with my friend the other day, and I don't like that it's two days, and I know why they do it. They do it because they get more money, um, and they get more uh, sponsorship opportunities and stuff. Normal people, one of the big draws to WrestleMania was I'd have all my friends over and we would have barbecue yeah. and soda or if they drank beer or whatever, and we'd have a good time. We'd all get together and watch it. And we'd have fun watching the pay-per-view. Yeah. People aren't getting together for two nights of pay-per-view. I'm sorry. No. It's not happening. And it prevents, it's such a deterrent that we don't even get together for one night of it anymore. Yeah. Uh, so I just think they need to get rid of that. Yeah. I don't like it. I, I'm yeah, the old I, man. I, I understood during 2020, because of COVID, they didn't want to do four hours of no audience, you yeah. know? So they split it up. And that's really the reason they split it up, was that they didn't want to do four or five hours with no audience. So Yeah, they broke it up. They got the audience now. You can go back to the <clears> way it's supposed to be. It's it's fine. Nobody's going to be mad. We'll do the five-hour pay-per-view. Uh, but we don't need a 10-hour one uh, divvied yeah. up. And not everybody needs to be on the card. I, I No <laughs> offense. No offense. I think they're all great. They're all superstars. They're all super talented. Not everybody needs to be at WrestleMania. I'm sorry. You have to earn your spot to be on the card. Hey, I'm sorry. This should be a WrestleMania card right here. You're going to have two personal feuds, okay, that are going to come to the head of the pay-per-view. Might be the first match, and then the next one, might, uh, the other one might be like the fourth match. You're going to have a tag title match. Probably a contenders match of some kind for another belt. You're going to have the IC title belt match, and then the main event is for the world title, or the world title. If you're Hulk Hogan and you're not the champion, you're the main event, and the world title matches before it. But <laughs> kidding aside, that that that's how the paper uh, WrestleMania most pay per views should be: two, a couple personal feuds, a contender match, a tag title match, secondary belt, main belt. You know. Uh, 
but now it's like, like you said, everybody on the roster is uh, getting a match. It's just crazy. It is crazy. And when Johnny Knoxville starts having matches at WrestleMania, I'm done with it. And also when you've got like a 12 man tag team match, you know, mixed tag team match or whatever, it's like they got 14 people in it. It's, you know why they're doing that. They're cramming them into it so they can all get a WrestleMania payday because they were bitching behind the scenes. Yeah, and, you know, um, it's, it makes the WrestleMania moments not so special. Like, honestly, until Roman Reigns and Seth Rollins are gone, I don't even know if I can watch wrestling regularly anymore because I just cannot stand either one of them. They are like, and I think we talked about this in a past episode, but I have a theory on what's wrong with modern wrestling, and it's that back in the 80s and 90s, it's because we're old and things were better back then. No. Uh, back in the 80s, Get off my lawn! <laughs> you had, you had, I think this is, I, I don't think this is that. I don't think I'm being old and curmudgeonly here. I think it's a good point. You had second and third generation wrestlers. You had people that came up in the independence or uh, people that were trained by the people that came up in the independence. And then you had the wrestling boom of the mid nineties until, you know, maybe like 2003 when it kind of started fizzling into what we have now. Mm -hmm. But now, and even in the early 2000s, you had some second or third generations pop up, the ones that were too young to be in the 90s, but, you know, were old enough at the beginning of the new millennium. You had that, and you still had people that were trained by, you know, some of the best in the business. But then, after that, like, let's say 2011, 2012, a lot of these guys, the old guys that we grew up watching that had the independent experience are retired, you know, or dead, and... The couple that were like second generation or whatever, you know, kind of fade out like Ted DiBiase Jr. just quit, uh, you know. But you, you have a handful of stars that are still fun, but they start getting too old as you get, you know, up to where we just have a lot of marks now is what I'm trying to get to. Like most of the roster for the past six, seven years, outside of the few that stuck around from the early 2000s, is people that were just huge wrestling fans, in the in the 90s and stuff so they're wanting to emulate like the most high uh energy moves and stuff from their childhood they want to do what this wrestler did what that wrestler did and it's high spot high spot high spot there's no more technical stuff there's no more tag uh you know tag matches where uh, they're actually using the ropes distracting the referee you know lack putting of, the food up in the corner lack of uh, storytelling lack of uh subtleties it's all about uh, the moves now it's it's <clears throat> This is the Michael Bay movie. Modern wrestling is like a Michael Bay movie. And it's, 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 people have enjoyed certain types of movies and stuff so much. It just comes to the explosions and excitement. That's all they want to do. That's what I see today. There's only a handful of wrestlers that I enjoy watching. Bray Wyatt is like my favorite of the current, you know, uh, people. And I thought Kurt, uh, Kurt Henning's son. I uh, was doing really good. McGilligutty, McGilligutty, was that what they called him in NXT? Yeah. Uh, but Mike yeah, McGilligutty or whatever his name was. Yeah. I'm just dragging on, guys. I'm sorry. My point is, I feel like there's a lot of marks in wrestling today, and not yeah. as many people that uh, really love the business. Like the business, they love the, the show, they love wrestling, and they've always wanted to do it. Uh, but they don't have that certain amount of heart that came with coming up in the independent circuit and, you know, like shortly after. Uh, that, that, that's my thought, anyways, and not getting trained by the legends. All right. Uh, all valid points. Let's get into the next wrestling story. All valid points. Now, shut up, Josh. Not going to comment on your theory at all. Let's, no, go ahead. Well, if we were at the Grammys or the Oscars, they would have hit the wrap it up button on your... Uh... I'll, I'll edit some of that out. I'm <laughs> sorry. I rambled. Uh, Kevin Nash recently said uh, that the Dark Side of the Ring may be working on a Scott Hall episode. So, are you familiar with Dark Side of the Ring? Oh, yeah. I love Dark Side of the Ring. Yes. I, just, I can't imagine Kevin's too happy to know. He is happy that they're going to do it. Because. No, I mean, well, go ahead. Go ahead. I'm just afraid that because sometimes they've exaggerated certain things on there. You mm -hmm. know, you've had lots of people come out and say it wasn't that, you know. And I just don't want them exaggerating the problems that Scott did have because they were pretty extreme on their own. You know, he's excited. I think Kevin Nash is excited because uh, I don't know if a lot of people know this, but Scott Hall uh, actually killed somebody. Uh, oh, he he was involved in a he was a he was like a bouncer at a strip club. 
uh, he was sleeping with someone's wife. The the guy's husband showed up to the strip club, and they Scott Hall ended up killing this guy because the guy was trying to kill him first. Well, Scott Hall carried that with him for his entire life. Uh, Scott right. Hall Scott Hall was a believer in God, and he basically thought he was going to hell because he killed somebody because of the Ten Commandments. So he had this like massive guilt and this massive bout of PTSD from from killing this man. So Kevin Nash said that he's happy that Dark Side of the Ring is going to cover it potentially because they'll be able to hit that angle yeah. uh, of Scott Hall, like what actually was uh, making Scott make some of these bad decisions because he was trying to self-medicate. Yeah. Because sometimes when they do biographies on A&E or like even WWE, they kind of like gloss over the really dark stuff. And they, they're going to come at it from an angle, hopefully, that's, you know, truthful and, and stuff that actually happened and kind of have the psychology of, like, why Scott made some of these really bad decisions with drugs and alcohol. So I would definitely look forward to seeing that episode. Um, you know, Josh and I are on record saying we miss Scott Hall. We, we loved his work. He was a great human being. I mean, Scott had demons like everybody else, man. Um, it was a really sad ending to a great, great life and a great career. Yeah. So I look, I look forward to seeing it. Yes. And uh, on the opposite side of the spectrum, Marty Jannetty might have killed somebody too, <laughs> and not. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> At the skating what? rink, I've, I've heard that story. Yeah, <laughs> somebody like hit hit on him or something. Yeah, it, it's guy crazy. or something. Yeah, it's crazy, man. If you want to, it's not something we're probably going to talk about, but Google it. Marty's yeah. murder. It's an interesting story. Um, <laughs> well, since you brought up Party Marty, I'm going to say something really quick. I was reading a tweet that Marty posted like two days ago. Um, somebody had asked if him and Shawn Michaels had slept together or something. And Marty kind of, instead of just saying, no, uh, we were both straight. No, that didn't happen. Marty decided to start talking about some of the craziest, most random off the wall stuff. And I feel like whoever is near Marty or loves Marty or has access to Marty, they need to, like, take the keyboard away from him. He does not need to have access to social media. He is a danger to himself and to anybody else that has access to his social media profile. <laughs> he is a mess. He's yeah. a mess. He always has been. I, I was excited in 06 when he came back for, like, three weeks. Yeah. And him and Michael, him and Shawn Michaels even had a tag match that uh, on SmackDown. And it was and, a good match. Yeah, it was against La yeah. Resistance. Yeah, they look good. Yeah, and then within two weeks, you know, and I think they were going to have a whole, like, multi-month story uh, with Shawn and Marty and stuff. And Marty threw it in the crapper. That was his blew last. Blew it again. Yeah, blew it again. Yeah, after Marty's eighth return to the WWE um, you know, one thing about Marty that they, he never had any growth in his character. He was always just rocker Marty. They never. An action he, figure. Well, he never, it, he never grew. I mean, it was like, okay, well, you're not with Sean anymore because he's a big star. Now you're going to be with Al Snow, Leif yeah. Erickson, and you're the new rockers. Okay, now that he's uh, got head and, he, and Marty got fired again for the third time, now we're bringing Marty back. Uh, to be the rocker again with Shawn Michaels for a short stint. It's like he never was anything other than a rocker, a rocker, which is what he was in the early eighties. He never, that is, that is actually bigger. it was the kind that you like push down on the shoulders, mm -hmm. and the legs go inside the toy. Yeah. And he jumped, like, it jumps up. <laughs> yeah. I still have that uh, in the, in the toy room. Yeah. We, the Hasbro. Yeah. Do we have an action figure? We do not. <laughs> so we can only criticize Marty so much. Yeah, we don't have it. We don't have an action figure yet. With that <laughs> yeah. attitude, we never will. Uh, Josh, big news in the wrestling industry: Macho Man Randy Savage's rap album from 2003 that features the hit song "Be a Man Hogan" uh, is going to be released on vinyl for Record Store Day this year. Oh, that's great! I, I had that album and the Hulk Hogan boot band, man. Uh, those <laughs> Hulkster songs. Hulkster in heaven. Hulkster in heaven. Yeah, the songs that Macho sang on his, though, the rap or whatever it was, it, you got to listen. I've listened to the whole album a couple times. It's, be a man, Hulk. <laughs> it's, most of the songs, you can tell how pissed he is at Hulk Hogan. I'll just put it that way. Um, 
I, if you guys have not listened to the Macho Man rap album, you're doing yourself and your family and your friends a huge disservice. It is like one of the greatest things ever. Um, the Be a Man Hulk is one of the most entertaining things I've ever heard. And to be honest with you, Josh, it's really not that bad. It's <laughs> okay. not horrible. Sure. It's not horrible. You heard it's, what I said, dude. Okay, I'll put it this way. It's definitely better than Hulk Hogan and the Traveling Boot Band or whatever. Jim but you need to listen to that one too, people. Just you got to for the fun of it. It's Hogan and then and Jimmy singing. It's it's what you would expect. Give it a listen. But yeah. All right. Last slash tracks wrestling story of the night. And this is actually number eighteen for the show because we talked about wrestling in a previous segment that wasn't even the wrestling segment. All right. On February seventeenth, Josh, two thousand two. Over 21 years ago, the NWO made their WWE debut at the pay-per-view No Way Out. Josh, what do you remember from them uh, debuting in the WWE? And were you pleased with their short run, or do you think it could have went different or better? Well, you know, I thought they were at their strongest when Booker T and Goldust were on in the New World Order, and Shawn Michaels, Shawn Michaels returned... To be a lackey, a manager. Like, he wasn't wrestling. He wasn't coming out as a manager. I don't know. He joined the NWO. <laughs> and then I remember the NWO, a guy that doesn't wrestle anymore. Because his back is hurt. But no, like, uh, I will say, I'll never forget the night they came out at No Way Out. And Jerry the King Lawler was like, by God, that's, or no, JR was like, by God, that's. Kevin Nash, Scott Hall, and Hulk Hogan, the NWO, and then, you know, uh, Jerry the King Lawler's like, yeah, but whose side are they on? And, uh... Oh, he did the Bobby Heenan thing? No, yeah, who, like... <laughs> they come out, hey, they come out as good guys. <laughs> They're total baby faces. My God, whose side are they on? <laughs> they help the rock. <laughs> uh, I just remember when they came, when they came back, I wasn't even... I was so over heel Hulk Hogan. And by that point, Hogan had already wrestled as the real American in WCW again. And he had also, yeah. And he had also wrestled as the real American in the X, the X, FL, WXL. Yeah. Extreme wrestling or whatever. Yeah. Uh, He he wrestled Mr. Perfect. Um, and he was in the red and yellow. Um, so I was full red and yellow Hogan again. I'd had enough Hollywood Hogan, for the rest of my life. I was it was crazy seeing NWO come out on WWF, but I could I had already seen what they did with the WCW storyline. Yeah. So I didn't really I didn't see the NWO working out, you know. You, you uh, knew they were gonna bury him basically. You, you needed the only way that worked is if they came in and started winning every match, man. Every match. But Stone Cold was never gonna put Scott Hall over, you know. Mm-hmm. Uh, Hogan needed to put The Rock over. That was the right thing to do. I think The Rock could have given him a return instead of having lose, instead of Hogan losing every time. That would have been cool on Hogan's way out. Mr. America was fun, don't get me wrong. But, like, it was just the NWO Invasion 2.0 was plagued. Or would it be 5.0 by that, by that point? Uh, How about 2.0? Um, well, it was, like, 6.0 by that point, like, the storylines. Because <laughs> WCW rebooted it, like, four or five times. But... When their their initial WWE run, it was played out. Like, um, I know. And Scott Hall was having major issues backstage with uh, alcoholism. Kevin Nash didn't he blow his quads out like in the first have a, fall back or something? Yeah. One like, of his first matches, he like really injured himself. Um, Hogan was so over at that WrestleMania 18 match. Just, he was literally biting The Rock on the head. And whipping the living hell out of him with his weightlifting belt. And the crowd refused to boo him. They cheered everything he did. There was literally nothing that Hogan could do that was going to stop uh, the fans from turning him into a baby face again. Yeah. And, you know, go ahead. No, I was just going to say it was like written in the stars. Like he was back in the WWF and the fans wanted him to be Hulk Hogan again. Yeah, Vancouver, for some reason, loves Bret Hart and Hulk Hogan. You know, you think is they love Bret Hart so much, he doesn't really care for Hogan. But no, they 
they brought Hulkamania back to life. But I think the only way that angle ever worked was if Vince was willing to let them win matches, like I said. And also, if somebody like Stone Cold or The Rock or Undertaker or somebody joined the NWO, you know, if they had somebody in-house turning on the WWF to help destroy it, Mm -hmm. maybe, but, you know, they were just throwing the giant in there. Oh, he was in there before, you know, Booker T. By the time Goldust and Shawn Michaels and all that, it was just, it was done. So so watered down. Like Scott was gone. I think it was just Kevin Nash, right? Scott Scott wrestled, hey, Scott wrestled, like, one pay-per-view and he was done. Like, at WrestleMania 18, that was it. Um, And I always thought it was funny that Kevin Nash didn't have a match at that WrestleMania. It was really bizarre to me. Like he should have fought uh, Triple H or something. You know, everybody was fighting one of the main ones or Undertaker. It, but it didn't make sense. Uh, Triple H was Triple H had just won the Royal Rumble, so he was wrestling Y two J for the yeah. undisputed title. Nash could have had something going on with somebody like Kurt nice. Angle yeah. or Undertaker or something, because um, Undertaker wrestled Ric Flair uh, in like a throwaway match. They they I I've heard Bruce Pritchard say that Undertaker. They, they said, well, we forgot to book you. They basically forgot to book the taker. And he who do you want to wrestle? And he said, okay, well, I'll, I've never wrestled Ric Flair, so I'll wrestle Ric Flair. So who was booking this pay-per-view? I mean, they didn't they, they did a really odd job. They're like, okay, Hogan and Rock, that's the first thing they had on their rundown. And then Stone Cold, they didn't really book him correctly. Uh, he was initially yeah. – St- Stone Cold was initially supposed to lose that match, by the way, to Scott Hall. And yeah. then he threw a fit backstage and they switched it so yeah. stone cold's not as cool as i thought he was he can't take a joke either uh, he's very serious about his craft he's like bret hart uh he's very serious about his character and if anybody knows about protecting their character josh since you were in the business if you don't watch your own back nobody else is going to do it for you dude no, that's why i don't have a problem with hogan like he he did what i would probably do if i was, had that kind of money coming in you know, uh, protect my spot. And, in fact, that's what Stone Cold was doing whenever he threw a fit and uh, wouldn't lose to Scott Hall. But that's what killed the story, though. The NWO came back and got their butts beat the first time they went out to the ring. Uh, Vince was never going to let this be as good as it could have been. And then Six came back. X-Pac came back. Uh, Oh, it was just just bad, man. It it, it was never going to be good. You know what? It was never... It was, even if they had booked it, even if they had booked it correctly and they put the NWO over at every chance they had, when Hogan wrestled The Rock at WrestleMania 18 at the Sky Dome in Toronto and the and the crowd took over the show, yeah. there was no way that Hulk Hogan was going to stay in the NWO. I don't care if it was booked correctly. They could have kept Nash and Hall and everybody else and added somebody else like you said. They could have done that. But as soon as Hogan showed up and was alive and was going to wrestle that match at WrestleMania 18, that was the end of the NWO, basically. And an early sign, Alex, if I can throw that on there since we're at the end of the segment here, an early sign the NWO was never meant to go anywhere would be that Triple H didn't join. It had Scott, it had Sean coming in, it had Kevin. And if it was going to be a big angle, Triple H would have wanted to be a part of it. He had he wanted no part of that, you know. He yeah. even had a segment, and he has inside information, so he probably already knew from Benny Mac, you know, his uh, dad-in-law. There, this isn't going anywhere. <laughs> he might not he, want to be a part of it. <laughs> yeah, he's like, hey, uh, Paul, why don't you come over here? Uh, you know, Sean's we're paying him. And he's not really doing anything. Uh, you know, what do you think of NWO? Uh, <laughs> put him in there. Well, uh, yeah, Vince, uh, it's a great idea. So anyway, I'm going to be the champ for the next 15 years. Uh, yeah. <laughs> Do you remember that time frame? It's like Triple yes. H had the bell on and off for like 12 years straight. Eric Bischoff just gave it to him one night. Just He didn't even have a match for it. It's like, here, <laughs> there you go. here's another title reign to go over Ric Flair. Yeah, uh, Triple H. So- uh, I lo- hey, we, we like Triple H a lot up here at Slash Track Studios. But, like, you know, did he really have to be, like, a 17-time world champion? Probably not. Uh, Josh, let's get into the new, the brand new segment, Dear yes. Slashy. Let's do it in this in this in this epic two hour episode. <laughs> if, hey, if you had to, so if this podcast episode was on a VHS tape and you went to your local video store to rent it, boys and girls, 
you would have to rent three different VHS copies to complete this episode. There we go. <laughs> All, right. <laughs> All right. Dear Slashy, this is what uh, Telly McHenrira, okay. I, I put McHenrira, he you. asked us. This is a real question. Okay, Josh. Okay. I am obsessed with serial killers. <laughs> I'm not crazy. But I wish I had other like-minded people to talk to me about this stuff with. Should I tell my friends and see if they're into them too? <laughs> Josh, why don't you start off with your answer, your uh, advice? It sounds like a, a young person, uh, so maybe uh, there's nothing wrong with being into true crime and serial killer stuff. I mean, they might be into it. I don't know how old you are. That would probably help. Um, Maybe, you know, do the classic, you know, oh, my God, you hear that story about that guy that, you know, until it's you know, a serial killer or something. You feel it out, feel out how they answer <laughs> it. Feel out how they feel. Mm -hmm. uh, I don't know. I wouldn't just come out and say, I love serial killer. You know, I wouldn't do that. But uh, thanks for your question. I wish I could give you a more clear answer. What do you got? Uh, okay. So the, my first question is, okay, do you – you're obsessed with serial killers. Now, are you obsessed with how they're caught? Or are you obsessed with how they did what they did? And are you obsessed as in, like, you like true crime or you're actually, like, a fan of the serial killers? Because... <laughs> did you have the yeah. trading cards? <laughs> yeah. If you're a fan of, like, the serial killer themselves, I, I think... Uh, it's probably not an answer you want to hear, but I think it's there's something that maybe you need to speak with someone about because uh, glorifying a serial killer is totally different than being into true crime. Uh, yeah. True crime is more of like a mystery situation. Everybody, a lot of people are fans of mysteries and a lot of them involve murders. Uh, but ultimately people aren't rooting for the killers. Yeah. Um, I think that if you are in fact, you know, kind of obsessed with serial killers and, and you're a fan of them and you, you want to collect their murderabilia and all this other stuff, I think you might need to talk to somebody about this because it doesn't sound very healthy. And I'm not judging you. No. Um, I think I'm more just concerned with uh, what angle you're coming at it from. Um, you know, we Josh and I love horror, but we don't, we're not actively rooting for Freddie and Jason to, to kill the teens. We're, we're just we're immersed in the storyline and, and the excitement of it and kind of the escape of it. And it's kind of like just, you know, escaping your every day to day, you know, day to day or whatever. It's kind of like a, you know, play, I'm at using your imagination almost as a kid, basically. It's a totally different thing. Um, I'm not rooting for Freddie to kill Nancy. Let's just put it that way. Um, so I guess what I'd like you to do is maybe write back to us in the comments and kind of like elaborate a little more and maybe we can help you a little bit better. Yeah. So please, Thanks for the question and maybe uh, and for helping us, you know, start this brand new segment. But I just I don't want to say something and not have the full uh, context of the question. Yeah. Yeah. And Alex, Alex, I'm not saying it is, but if this was your question, yes, I will talk true crime with you after the show. <laughs> are you that sure, was, Josh? <laughs> Josh, are you OK? with this? Uh, Josh, let's get into Slash Tracks Horror. Let's do it. All right. On February 27th. 1987, 36 years ago, A Nightmare on Elm Street, Dream Warriors, was released in theaters. Josh, my favorite Nightmare on Elm Street movie ever made. We're actually covering it for Slash Tracks Reviews. Uh, the next episode, which will come out after this podcast episode, which will be you know released this weekend probably. Uh, Josh, what's your thoughts on Dream Warriors? Just j don't give a full review. No, no. I, you know, I didn't what's see your thoughts? it until I was... I didn't see it until I was a teenager. I mean, I guess I saw, like, clips and stuff of it if it was on TV. But, like, uh, we had, my, my brother had a recorded copy of the first Elm Street, so I saw that one more than anything in the sequel. Um, it, it's not my favorite in the series, but I think it's one of the best in the first, it, it's the best of the first six, I'll put it that way. I'm a big fan of New Nightmare, but that's a whole other can of worms. It's not even Freddy! Okay, but, okay, if, I, if we're just doing the Freddy movies where it's not a demon taking the form of Freddy, then yes, this, uh, my opinion is Dream Warriors was the best story. And the novelization, cheap plug here for the channel, the novelization 
was actually based off of the shooting script, the Wes Craven script, and another one. So the audio book of it, you can go listen to, uh, you'll get a totally different version of Dream Warriors. Uh, it's pretty mm-hmm. cool. You, get, you can kind of see what might have been. Yeah. Brings a dragon. He turns into a dragon. Uh, yeah. But yeah. That's my thoughts on, on Dream Warriors. Okay, my thoughts on Dream Warriors. My favorite movie in the franchise. Uh, perfect blend of comedic Freddy, scary Freddy. Yeah. Has some of the most uh, great, has some of the best kills in the franchise, has some of the scariest scenes in the franchise, especially when Patricia Arquette uh, uses the water faucet and then has her, you know, it turns into Freddy's glove. Yeah. That's, that's scary. The yeah. marionette where he, Freddy uses the kid's tendons to walk him right out of the window. Uh, great yeah. movie. Slash Tracks reviews coming up. Uh, episode number three, be on the lookout for that. But yeah, I, I love Dream Warriors. I'm glad it was made. And Josh, we also have an interview with uh, Ira Hyden, one of the Dream Warriors, Will, on the channel. So if you weren't aware of that and you haven't seen it, check out uh, down below or scroll through our lists of uh, previous episodes to check that out. Josh, February 13th, 2009, 14 years ago, the greatest Friday the 13th film ever made uh, by, uh, what is it, Bloomhouse or whatever? Yeah. Uh, the Friday the 13th reboot was released in theaters. Josh, what's your thoughts on that remake? I liked it. I look forward to reviewing it. and maybe Me too. Even, maybe even riffing it. Uh, but that's up to you guys and Master Evil. But I, I, I've talked about it before on, on with you. I've talked about it with uh, Sean on Out of Print Slashers. I look at number 12. At number 12. I look at the reboot as number 12. Uh, you know, and I, I kind of just pretend like it's not a remake and the beginning's just a recap. Mm-hmm. And that Jason's just been out there for so long without anybody coming out there, you know, that he's not being damaged anymore. So he's kind of like regenerated back to almost human. And the town's just learned to stay away. And I have more fun with the movie doing that. But as a reboot, it wasn't great. No, it, it, it's forgettable. Uh, I did like how Jason moved underground and how we got like a supernatural uh, versus uh, uh, Jason <laughs> with, uh, you know, Sam Winchester being in the movie. What did you think of it? I, I really liked it. Um, it was the second Jason movie I ever got to see in the theaters because I saw Freddy versus Jason and then I saw uh, the 2009 reboot um, or remake or whatever. Um, I don't like that like they, I, I'm pretty, po- I'm fairly positive that the two of the guys that worked on Freddy versus Jason also worked on the 2009 remake, um, and they kind of borrowed some of the stuff. Uh, like when, not that they borrowed it, but like the ending was like very. I don't even know what I'm trying to say here, but it just it had a very similar tone of Freddy <laughs> versus Jason. Jason, I don't even know what the correct what i'm thinking it's almost like a feel well like they say could... that they say that freddie and jason and freddie versus jason are like different universe of those two like it's mm-hmm. not a collective thing so you know may, yeah. maybe <laughs> i don't know i really like that i got to see willa ford naked uh when she was swimming uh in the water she gets the oh, machete yeah. through the head she was a pop star back then uh slashaholics in case you don't but yeah, she was like Britney Spears. Uh, she was like the dollar store version of Britney Spears. Oh, okay. and, yeah, getting to see her naked was a real treat for a younger Alex. Um, a Trent is the guy who owns the cabin. Uh, he plays one of the best unlikable characters in the history of Friday the 13th. He does an amazing job. And he also does a really good job on Netflix's You. Uh, I believe it's season three. He's one of the um, people, like he's... He's like a fitness expert. They go out to the woods and they do like man stuff. And <laughs> like, he's just great in everything he does. He's really underrated. He's a great, uh, you hate him in that film. Uh, he uses the word stupendous uh, in that war, in that movie uh, perfectly. I, I enjoy it. It's fun for what it is. I, just, I'll go back and rewatch it every once in a while. Eric Mears did good. You know, he like, did. He did. The, the Jason in this one and Freddy versus Jason are very different Jasons than what we're used to. But Derek did good. Um, yeah, I was going to leave it at that. Yeah. If you haven't seen it, check it out. And actually, Horror Pack, uh, I got that, uh, the 2009 remake in the one of the Horror Pack boxes we got. So a little shameless plug for Horror Pack. Uh, Josh, Scream 6 is in theaters right now. 
Uh, it's made $140 million on a $33 million budget. I saw it two weeks ago. Um, I had fun. It had some parts that really dragged. And it was probably one of the most, like, um, Ghostface with a shotgun was really, really interesting. And I really enjoyed the scene when they're in the market. Yeah. It's very scary. It's got a lot of uh, excitement to it. Um, it really felt dangerous when he was in there uh, stalking the two main girls. Um, has one of the most... I, I, spoiler alert, but not spoiler alert. Um, if you pay attention closely, y it has... like You'll figure out who the killer or killers are quickly if you pay yeah, attention. Yeah, we did that in five. Yeah. Like early um, on. Yeah, Scream 6 is definitely fun. Um, they, here's another spoiler alert. So, uh, if people, okay, so people are getting stabbed in this movie it, that would have absolutely killed them in previous movies, but in this yeah. one, they don't die for some reason. So I guess some of the heroes in this movie are now Jason Voorhees. Like you just can't kill them. They're like Michael Myers, uh, doesn't make sense, but whatever, but it's fun. Um, I'm not a big fan of ghost Billy Loomis, Obi-Wan Kalubis. Uh, Columbus or whatever. Okay. He's in six two. Um, he looks even older now. He looks exhausted <laughs> at this point. Um, he's been dead for twenty, you know, over twenty years, but he's been ghost Billy Loomis now for you know going on thirty. He looks exhausted. He's I'm the not... oldest looking ghost teenager of all time. <laughs> well, you know, Hatchet was a ghost teenager uh, <laughs> or something. No, okay. Uh, I think Hatchet. they should. I think they should have done something more legacy. At the yeah. end of the movie, you know, tied it back to the originals better uh, for Scream 6. And mm -hmm. if they go forward, I think it might be, I don't know, maybe it'd be crazy stupid, but they've, they've done the same thing so much. What if they did go supernatural? In a, they're they're in, already kind of going that way right now. I think um, Ghostface in Space is next. <laughs> Ghostface in Space, there we go. Um, the la and one more quick thing on Scream 6 before we get into the last horror story of the episode. Uh, you said if they make a seven, this is the highest grossing Scream film they've had That's... in the franchise so far, and it's only been out for like two. Or, well, not the highest grossing total, but like it's making money the fastest, uh, based on its budget and how much money it's brought in. It's gonna they're gonna make a seven. There's no way they're not. You youngins, man, y'all are ruining it. You're, you're ruining the genre. Okay, if, if these are what are successful, that's what all the future horror movies are going to be like Skeet uh, Ulrich a hey, Skeet Ulrich Billy Loomis himself is like yes I am so excited to be yes payday another payday um okay so, so here's a, here's a scary movie that's coming out in the theaters that Josh and I are stoked to go see Evil Dead Rise the new <laughs> Evil Dead movie um is going to be released in theaters in the U.S. on April 21st by Warner Brothers um Right now, Josh, it currently holds a 96% fresh rating on so, Rotten Tomatoes. And it actually, for like a week, was at 100% fresh. Oh, yeah, I'm looking forward to that. That's wow. Be... Josh, that, that's impressive for a horror movie. That's, that's unheard of. That is unheard of, man. Sam Raimi, man. Uh, <laughs> that's unheard of. That's unheard of. Um. I sent you that clip at the con where Bruce Campbell, somebody said something. They, they had a pre-screening. Yeah. yeah, they had a pre-screening of Evil Dead Rise. And um, I think Bruce Campbell is like an Easter egg in this film. So if you pay attention, he's in the film. You have to like be paying attention. Uh, yeah. It's like a, but anyway, somebody says like, this movie is a piece of garbage or something. And Bruce Campbell's like, well, why the F are you here? You know, you can leave. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, bye. And he's ba yeah, he's basically cussing out the person who's screaming at the, you know, the panel. And everybody in the audience cheers. It's like the weirdest moment ever. Why are you at an Evil Dead convention for the new movie if you hate the franchise? Maybe he's just a, just a troll, or he was expecting it to be like tied to the first three movies or something, you know? And mm -hmm. he just can't let that go that Bruce has done. Either way, I uh, applaud Bruce for that. Uh, I'm looking forward to, the, to seeing this. Uh, there's an episode of, uh, oh my God. I can't think of the name right now. Creep Show, uh, where Sam Raimi and Ted Raimi are in it. They uh, produce the episode, and it's it's got the Necronomicon. It's got Deadites, and like a guy like Bob Ross fighting them. 
uh, in this TV studio. It's on. Uh, it's on. Oh my god, dude! Screenbox or. It's on Creep Show on Hulu. So check okay. it out. Yeah. Um, Josh, let's get into uh, Slash Strikes headlines. Okay. All right. Swedish motorcycle company releases the first airbag jeans for motorcycle riders. Swedish motorcycle brand uh, MoCycle has introduced the world's first airbag jeans. They're, wow. desi- they're designed to provide lower body impact protection for riders. So basically an airbag for your, for your butt. And they offer 10 times better impact energy absorption than their traditional pads uh, that have been around forever. And they, they activate when a rider is ejected or separated from their bike. Okay. <laughs> Airbags for your booty. My, my luck, I'd just get off of the bike and it would be like, oh, sensor. And then just... <laughs> <laughs> I saw the photo for this. Um, it's hilarious. So I, right I def- from, uh, don't touch this video or something. <laughs> yeah, baby got back. Uh, yeah. Sir Mix a Lot is actually going to be a sponsor for MoCycle. Uh, it's hilarious. No, he, I don't know if he is or not, but it's it's great. Um, Chicago armed robber stayed at scene of crime to eat the victim's fried chicken. Well, I mean, you got to have the chicken, man. Yeah. You can't, you can't do the crime if you don't eat the chicken. And that's what the saying is. Prosecutors in Chicago, Josh, say the armed robber, James Taylor stayed at the scene of the crime to consume the victim's fried chicken. When Chicago PD arrived, they found Taylor eating the food as if nothing had happened. Uh, if convicted, Taylor f- f- faces up to 21 years in prison, all because he was hungry. Hey, I got a perfect pen pal for him. The person, that, uh, the person that asked for advice earlier. And they could uh, talk about serial killers and murderers together. Um, uh I, I, there's no fried chicken in the world, Josh, that's good enough for me to stay and be arrested for. Are you kidding me right now, dude? Maybe he's just a scary dude, man. Like, just imagine that. Somebody killing somebody and just being brazen to sit there eating food, waiting for the cops to show up. You know? Or he's yeah. so... He's just so hungry, yeah. <laughs> so confident. No, he's so, he's so famished from <laughs> robbing the piss out of this family. He's like, I, got, I cannot carry all these luxury and top flight goods without having a decent meal. I'm going to have to, I'm going to have to eat. I'm so famished from robbing the piss out of this family that I have to eat their fried chicken. So not only did he rob all their, their goodies, he took their meal. He's like the Grinch, Josh. He took the last can of hoo hash. See, I misunderstood. I thought I heard you say he killed someone. No, he didn't. He killed the meal. He killed the fried chicken. Yeah. So the joke doesn't work for the pen pal thing. Um, That's all right. (laughs) But it's okay. Uh, yeah, that that's uh, that's some good chicken. That that's that sounds like a KFC commercial, you know, or a Snickers uh, commercial. Hungry? <laughs> Why? You're not you when you're hungry. <laughs> and he's a robber. He's there. He's like everybody's tied up. Uh, or he was using the fried chicken to gag them, like t- t- so they shut up. And then he's like, wait a second. I kind of want that fried chicken. <laughs> and then he took the leg out of the victim's mouth, and then they were able to like you know call the cops. Uh, KFC, our chicken's so good, you'll go. You'll do time for it. You'll do 21 years at the federal penitentiary. Josh, a nine-hour cut of Avatar 3 is rumored to be uh, <laughs> turning into a limited series for Disney, Disney Plus that could release after the release of the theatrical cut in 2024. So, Slashaholics, there could be a nine-hour cut of Avatar 3 available. Nine hours. Almost the same length as of this podcast episode. Yeah, I'm, I'm not down for it. I haven't even seen the sequel. don't know if I will. <laughs> I haven't seen the first Avatar. I haven't seen the second Avatar. It just looks like it's not for me. I, I, I'm not the target audience for Avatar. I'm sorry. South Park handled it perfectly. They called it Dances with Smurfs. And uh, the storyline, it's, it's so accurate. If you want to see it, watch uh, South Park's version. Um, I was going to say really quick... Uh, James Cameron has a huge history of doing great uh, movies, uh, doing big box office, Titanic, Terminator 2, the first Avatar, whatever. Uh, it's just not for me. It just doesn't look like... I, I gave it a shot. It just looked like... It, it bored the living hell out of me. Uh, I watched like 20 minutes of it. It's just... I'm not into it. Yeah. Um, Josh, last story of the episode. Wow. Okay. We're there. Three okay. and a half hours later, we're there. All right. 
Fruit Roll-Ups has been forced to issue a warning about eating the plastic wrappers. So basically, uh, TikTok at, right now has a viral trend of freezing Fruit Roll-Ups. So TikTokers are freezing these. They're, um, they're putting stuff in them. They're filling them with ice cream. They're doing a bunch of different stuff. Um, so anyway, Fruit Roll-Ups got, got a hold of some of the TikTok uh, viral videos, and they're like, hey, this is exciting. This is like free advertisement. Yeah. Well... The brand for you know the brand ambassador or the person who's in charge of the marketing for fruit roll-ups noticed that in some of the TikTok videos they're actually eating the plastic around oh, the God. fruit roll-ups. So TikTok or excuse me, General Mills and Fruit Roll-ups themselves, the company, had to actually issue a warning to not eat the plastic. And they said, listen, it's fun to do things with fruit roll-ups. It's fun to eat them, freeze them, do do neat things with them. Please do not eat the plastic. Yeah. Oh my God. Don't don't hold your breath so long that you die. I mean, did, why did, are we really to a point where we're getting that close to idiocracy? <laughs> People. Yeah, like, you can't eat the plastic around the fruit roll-ups. Um, can't shoot up bleach, stuff like that. So. Yeah. Don't don't eat Tide Pods. Oh my God. Josh, man, jam-packed episode, sponsored <laughs> episode. Uh, factor 75 yeah factor 75 uh, check us out hit our email up at slash tracks 2020 at gmail.com for questions suggestions uh, maybe you want to be on dear slashy you want to have the question for us would you rather have a question for us you want to sponsor a future episode you want to be in a future episode you want to be on the wheel of topics on the patreon you want to be a patreon member all that good stuff slash tracks 2020 at gmail.com in the show josh all right, and also be sure to check out our Patreon at patreon.com forward slash 80 slash your librarian. Uh, the links and stuff will be what, what you go to be on the screen. Thank you all so much for uh, coming back to the podcast with us. It's been a long show, but it's been a fun one. Uh, good night. Be excellent to each other. Uh, say good night, Alex. Good night, Alex. Mahalo, darling.